Elizabeth Angela Marguerite Bose Leone, the 4th of August 1900 to the 30th of March 2002, was Queen of the United Kingdom and the Dominions of the British Commonwealth from the 11th of December 1936 to the 6th of February 1952 as the wife of King George VI. She was the last Empress of India from her husband's accession 1936 until the British Raj was dissolved in August 1947. After her husband died, she was known as Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, to avoid confusion with her daughter, Queen Elizabeth II. Born into a family of British nobility, Elizabeth came to prominence in 1923 when she married the Duke of York, the second son of King George V and Queen Mary. The couple and their daughters Elizabeth and Margaret embodied traditional ideas of family and public service. The Duchess undertook a variety of public engagements and became known for her consistently cheerful countenance. In 1936, Elizabeth's husband unexpectedly became king when his older brother, Edward VIII, abdicated in order to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson. Elizabeth then became queen consort. She accompanied her husband on diplomatic tours to France and North America before the start of the Second World War. During the war, her seemingly indomitable spirit provided moral support to the British public. After the war, her husband's health deteriorated, and she was widowed at the age of 51. Her elder daughter, aged 25, became the new queen. After the death of Queen Mary in 1953, Elizabeth was viewed as the matriarch of the British royal family. In her later years, she was a consistently popular member of the family, even at times when other royals were suffering from low levels of public approval. She continued an active public life until just a few months before her death at the age of 101, seven weeks after the death of her younger daughter, Princess Margaret. Elizabeth Angela Marguerite Bose Leone was the youngest daughter and the ninth of ten children of Claude Bose Leone, Lord Glamis, later the 14th Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn in the Peerage of Scotland, and his wife, Cecilia Cavendish Bentinck. Her mother was descended from British Prime Minister William Cavendish Bentinck, 3rd Duke of Portland, and Governor General of India Richard Wellesley, 1st Marquess Wellesley who was the elder brother of another Prime Minister, Arthur Wellesley, 1st Duke of Wellington. The location of Elizabeth's birth remains uncertain, but reputedly she was born either in her parents' Westminster home at Belgrave Mansions, Grosvenor Gardens, or in a horse-drawn ambulance on the way to a hospital. Other possible locations include Forbes House in Ham, London, the home of her maternal grandmother, Louisa Scott. Her birth was registered at Hitchin, Hertfordshire, near the Strathmore's English country house, St. Paul's Waldenbury, which was also given as her birthplace in the census the following year. She was christened there on 23 September 1900, in the local parish church, All Saints. Elizabeth spent much of her childhood at St. Paul's Walden and at Glamis Castle, the Earl's ancestral home in Scotland. She was educated at home by a governess until the age of eight, and was fond of field sports, ponies and dogs. When she started school in London, she astonished her teachers by precociously beginning an essay with two Greek words from Xenophon's Anabasis. Her best subjects were literature and scripture. After returning to private education under a German-Jewish governess, Kata Kubler, she passed the Oxford local examination with distinction at age 13. On Elizabeth's 14th birthday, Britain declared war on Germany. Four of her brothers served in the army. Eventually, in January 1923, Elizabeth agreed to marry Albert, despite her misgivings about royal life. Albert's freedom in choosing Elizabeth, not a member of a royal family, though the daughter of a peer, was considered a gesture in favor of political modernization. Previously, 
Princes were expected to marry princesses from other royal families. They selected a platinum engagement ring featuring a cashmere sapphire with two diamonds adorning its sides. They married on 26 April 1923, at Westminster Abbey. Unexpectedly, Elizabeth laid her bouquet at the tomb of the unknown warrior on her way into the abbey, in memory of her brother Fergus. Elizabeth became styled Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Following a wedding breakfast at Buckingham Palace prepared by Chef Gabriel Chumi, the new Duchess and her husband honeymooned at Polesden Lacey, a manor house in Surrey owned by the wealthy socialite and friend Margaret Greville. They then went to Scotland, where she caught, unromantic, whooping cough. After a successful royal visit to Northern Ireland in July 1924, the Labour government agreed that Albert and Elizabeth could tour East Africa from December 1924 to April 1925. The Labour government was defeated by the Conservatives in a general election in November, which Elizabeth described as marvellous, to her mother, and the Governor-General of Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, Sir Lee Stack, was assassinated three weeks later. Despite this, the tour went ahead, and they visited Aden, Kenya, Uganda, and Sudan, but Egypt was avoided because of political tensions. Albert had a stammer, which affected his ability to deliver speeches, and after October 1925, Elizabeth assisted in helping him through the therapy devised by Lionel Logue, an episode portrayed in the 2010 film The King's Speech. In 1926, the couple had their first child, Princess Elizabeth, Lilibet, to the family, who would later become Queen Elizabeth II. Albert and Elizabeth, without their child, travelled to Australia to open Parliament House in Canberra in 1927. She was, in her own words, very miserable at leaving the baby. Eventually, in January 1923, Elizabeth agreed to marry Albert, despite her misgivings about royal life. Albert's freedom in choosing Elizabeth, not a member of a royal family, though the daughter of a peer, was considered a gesture in favor of political modernization. Previously, princes were expected to marry princesses from other royal families. They selected a platinum engagement ring featuring a cashmere sapphire with two diamonds adorning its sides. They married on 26 April 1923, at Westminster Abbey. Unexpectedly, Elizabeth laid her bouquet at the tomb of the unknown warrior on her way into the abbey, in memory of her brother Fergus. Elizabeth became styled Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Following a wedding breakfast at Buckingham Palace prepared by Chef Gabriel Chumi, the new Duchess and her husband honeymooned at Polesden Lacey, a manor house in Surrey owned by the wealthy socialite and friend Margaret Greville. They then went to Scotland, where she caught, unromantic, whooping cough. After a successful royal visit to Northern Ireland in July 1924, the Labour government agreed that Albert and Elizabeth could tour East Africa from December 1924 to April 1925. The Labour government was defeated by the Conservatives in a general election in November, which Elizabeth described as marvellous, to her mother and the Governor-General of Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, Sir Lee Stack, was assassinated three weeks later. Despite this, the tour went ahead, and they visited Aden, Kenya, Uganda, and Sudan, but Egypt was avoided because of political tensions. Albert had a stammer, which affected his ability to deliver speeches, and after October 1925, Elizabeth assisted in helping him through the therapy devised by Lionel Logue, an episode portrayed in the 2010 film The King's Speech. In 1926, the couple had their first child, Princess Elizabeth, Lilibet, to the family, who would later become Queen Elizabeth II. Albert and Elizabeth, without their child, travelled to Australia to open Parliament House in Canberra in 1927. 
She was, in her own words, very miserable at leaving the baby. She charmed the public in Fiji when, as she was shaking hands with a long line of official guests, a stray dog walked in on the ceremony. She shook its paw as well. In New Zealand she fell ill with a cold and missed some engagements, but enjoyed the local fishing in the Bay of Islands accompanied by Australian sports fisherman Harry Andreas. On the return journey, via Mauritius, the Suez Canal, Malta and Gibraltar, their transport, HMS Renown, caught fire and they prepared to abandon ship before the fire was brought under control. Her second daughter, Princess Margaret, was born at Glamis Castle in 1930. On 20 January 1936, King George V died and his eldest son, Edward, Prince of Wales, became King Edward VIII. George had expressed private reservations about his successor, saying, I pray God that my eldest son will never marry and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. Just months into Edward's reign, his decision to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson caused a constitutional crisis. Although legally Edward could have married Simpson, as king he was also head of the Church of England, which at that time did not allow divorced people to remarry. Edward's ministers believed that the people would never accept Simpson as queen and advised against the marriage. As a constitutional monarch, Edward was obliged to follow ministerial advice. Rather than abandon his plans to marry Simpson, he chose to abdicate in favor of his brother Albert, who reluctantly became king in his place on the 11th of December 1936 under the regnal name of George VI. George VI and Elizabeth were crowned King and Queen of Great Britain, Ireland and the British Dominions, and Emperor and Empress of India in Westminster Abbey on 12 May 1937, the date previously scheduled for Edward VIII. Elizabeth's crown was made of platinum and was set with the Koh i Noor diamond. Edward and Simpson married and became the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. But while Edward was a royal highness, George VI withheld the style from the Duchess, a decision that Elizabeth supported. Elizabeth was later quoted as referring to the Duchess as that woman, and the Duchess referred to Elizabeth as cookie, because of her supposed resemblance to a fat Scots cook. Claims that Elizabeth remained embittered towards the Duchess were denied by her close friends. The Duke of Grafton wrote that she never said anything nasty about the Duchess of Windsor, except to say she really hadn't got a clue what she was dealing with. In summer 1938, a state visit to France by the King and Queen was postponed for three weeks because of the death of the Queen's mother, Lady Strathmore. In two weeks, Norman Hartnell created an all-white trousseau for the Queen, who could not wear colours as she was still in mourning. The visit was designed to bolster Anglo-French solidarity in the face of aggression from Nazi Germany. The French press praised the demeanor and charm of the royal couple during the delayed but successful visit, augmented by Hartnell's wardrobe. Nevertheless, Nazi aggression continued, and the government prepared for war. After the Munich Agreement of 1938 appeared to forestall the advent of armed conflict, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was invited onto the balcony of Buckingham Palace with the King and Queen to receive acclamation from a crowd of well-wishers. While broadly popular among the general public, Chamberlain's policy towards Hitler was the subject of some opposition in the House of Commons, which led historian John Grigg to describe the King's behaviour in associating himself so prominently with a politician as the most unconstitutional act by a British sovereign in the present century and the king will never leave. Elizabeth visited troops, hospitals, factories, and parts of Britain that were targeted by the German Luftwaffe, in particular the East End near London's docks. Her visits initially provoked hostility. Rubbish was thrown at her and the crowds jeered, in part because she wore expensive clothes that served to alienate her from people suffering the deprivations of war. 
She explained that if the public came to see her they would wear their best clothes, so she should reciprocate in kind. Norman Hartnell dressed her in gentle colors and avoided black to represent the rainbow of hope. When Buckingham Palace itself took several hits during the height of the bombing, Elizabeth said, I'm glad we've been bombed. It makes me feel I can look the East End in the face. Though the King and Queen spent the working day at Buckingham Palace, partly for security and family reasons they stayed at night at Windsor Castle about 20 miles, 32 kilometers, west of central London with the Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. The palace had lost much of its staff to the army, and most of the rooms were shut. The windows were shattered by bomb blasts, and had to be boarded up. During the Phony War, the Queen was given revolver training because of fears of imminent invasion. Adolf Hitler is said to have called her, the most dangerous woman in Europe, because he viewed her popularity as a threat to German interests. However, before the war both she and her husband, like most of Parliament and the British public, had supported appeasement and Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, believing after the experience of the First World War that war had to be avoided at all costs. After the resignation of Chamberlain, the King asked Winston Churchill to form a government. Although the king was initially suspicious of Churchill's character and motives, in due course both the king and queen came to respect and admire him. And the king will never leave. Elizabeth visited troops, hospitals, factories, and parts of Britain that were targeted by the German Luftwaffe, in particular the East End near London's docks. Her visits initially provoked hostility. Rubbish was thrown at her and the crowds jeered, in part because she wore expensive clothes that served to alienate her from people suffering the deprivations of war. She explained that if the public came to see her they would wear their best clothes, so she should reciprocate in kind. Norman Hartnell dressed her in gentle colors and avoided black to represent the rainbow of hope. When Buckingham Palace itself took several hits during the height of the bombing, Elizabeth said, I'm glad we've been bombed. It makes me feel I can look the East End in the face. Though the King and Queen spent the working day at Buckingham Palace, partly for security and family reasons they stayed at night at Windsor Castle about 20 miles, 32 kilometers, west of central London with the Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. The palace had lost much of its staff to the army, and most of the rooms were shut. The windows were shattered by bomb blasts, and had to be boarded up. During the Phony War, the Queen was given revolver training because of fears of imminent invasion. Adolf Hitler is said to have called her, the most dangerous woman in Europe, because he viewed her popularity as a threat to German interests. However, before the war both she and her husband, like most of Parliament and the British public, had supported appeasement and Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, believing after the experience of the First World War that war had to be avoided at all costs. After the resignation of Chamberlain, the King asked Winston Churchill to form a government. Although the King was initially suspicious of Churchill's character and motives, in due course both the King and Queen came to respect and admire him. Elizabeth's political views were rarely disclosed, but a letter she wrote in 1947 described Attlee's high hopes of a socialist heaven on earth as fading and presumably describes those who voted for him as poor people, so many half-educated and bemused. I do love them. Woodrow Wyatt thought her much more pro-conservative than other members of the royal family, but she later told him, I like the dear old Labour Party. She also told the Duchess of Grafton, I love communists. During the 1947 royal tour of South Africa, Elizabeth's serene public behavior was broken, exceptionally, when she rose from the royal car to strike an admirer with her umbrella because she had mistaken his enthusiasm for hostility.
The 1948 Royal Tour of Australia and New Zealand was postponed because of the King's declining health. In March 1949, he had a successful operation to improve the circulation in his right leg. In summer 1951, Elizabeth and her daughters fulfilled the King's public engagements in his place. In September, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. After a lung resection, he appeared to recover, but the delayed trip to Australia and New Zealand was altered so that Princess Elizabeth and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, went in the King and Queen's place, in January 1952. The King died in his sleep on 6 February 1952 while Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh were in Kenya on a Commonwealth tour, and with George's death his daughter immediately became Queen Elizabeth II. Shortly after George VI's death, Elizabeth began to be styled as Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother because the normal style for the widow of a king, Queen Elizabeth, would have been too similar to the style of her elder daughter, who had become Queen Elizabeth II. Popularly, she became the Queen Mother, or the Queen Mum. She was devastated by her husband's death and retired to Scotland. However, after a meeting with the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, she broke her retirement and resumed her public duties. Eventually she became just as busy as Queen Mother as she had been as Queen Consort. In July 1953, she undertook her first overseas visit since the funeral when she visited the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland with Princess Margaret. She laid the foundation stone of the University College of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, the current University of Zimbabwe. Upon her return to the region in 1957, Elizabeth was inaugurated as the college's president, and attended other events that were deliberately designed to be multiracial. During her daughter's extensive tour of the Commonwealth over 1953-54, Elizabeth acted as a counselor of state and looked after her grandchildren, Charles and Anne. In February 1959, she visited Kenya and Uganda. Elizabeth oversaw the restoration of the remote castle of May, on the north coast of Scotland, which she used to get away from everything, for three weeks in August and ten days in October each year. She developed her interest in horse racing, particularly steeplechasing, which had been inspired by the amateur jockey Lord Mildmay in 1949. She owned the winners of approximately 500 races. Her distinctive colors of blue with buff stripes were carried by horses such as Special Cargo, the winner of the 1984 Whitbread Gold Cup, and Devon Locke which spectacularly halted just short of the winning post at the 1956 Grand National and whose jockey Dick Francis later had a successful career as the writer of racing-themed detective stories. Peter Cazalet was her trainer for over 20 years. Although, contrary to rumor, she never placed bets, she did have the racing commentaries piped direct to her London residence, Clarence House, so she could follow the races. In February 1964, Elizabeth had an emergency appendectomy, which led to the postponement of a planned tour of Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji until 1966. She recuperated during a Caribbean cruise aboard the royal yacht, Britannia. In December 1966, she underwent an operation to remove a tumor, after she was diagnosed with colon cancer. Contrary to rumors which subsequently spread, she did not have a colostomy. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1984 and a lump was removed from her breast. Her bouts with cancer were never made public during her lifetime. During her widowhood she continued to travel extensively, including on over 40 official visits overseas. In 1975, Elizabeth visited Iran at the invitation of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. 
The British ambassador and his wife, Anthony and Sheila Parsons, noted how the Iranians were bemused by her habit of speaking to everyone regardless of status or importance, and hoped the Shah's entourage would learn from the visit to pay more attention to ordinary people. Between 1976 and 1984, she made annual summer visits to France, which were among 22 private trips to continental Europe between 1963 and 1992. In 1982, Elizabeth was rushed to hospital when a fishbone became stuck in her throat, and had an operation to remove it. Being a keen angler, she calmly joked afterwards, the salmon have got their own back. Similar incidents occurred at Balmoral in August 1986, when she was hospitalized at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary overnight but no operation was needed, and in May 1993, when she was admitted to the infirmary for surgery under general anesthetic. In 1987, Elizabeth was criticized when it emerged that two of her nieces, Catherine and Nerissa Bose Leone, had both been committed to the Royal Earlswood Asylum for Mental Defectives, a psychiatric hospital in Red Hill, Surrey in 1941, because they had severe learning disabilities. However, Burke's peerage had listed the sisters as dead, apparently because their mother, Fenella, Elizabeth's sister-in-law, was extremely vague when it came to filling in forms and might not have completed the paperwork for the family entry correctly. When Nerissa died in 1986, her grave was originally marked with a plastic tag and a serial number. Elizabeth said that the news of their institutionalization came as a surprise to her. In her later years, Elizabeth became known for her longevity. Her 90th birthday, the 4th of August 1990, was celebrated by a parade on the 27th of June that involved many of the 300 organizations of which she was a patron. In 1995, she attended events commemorating the end of the war 50 years before, and had two operations, one to remove a cataract in her left eye, and one to replace her right hip. In 1998, her left hip was replaced after it was broken when she slipped and fell during a visit to Sandringham Stables. Elizabeth's 100th birthday was celebrated in a number of ways. A parade that celebrated the highlights of her life included contributions from Sir Norman Wisdom and Sir John Mills. Her image appeared on a special commemorative £20 note issued by the Royal Bank of Scotland, and she attended a lunch at the Guildhall, London, at which George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, accidentally attempted to drink her glass of wine. Her quick admonition of, that's mine, caused widespread amusement. In November 2000, she broke her collarbone in a fall that kept her recuperating at home over Christmas and the New Year. On 1 August 2001, Elizabeth had a blood transfusion for anemia after suffering from mild heat exhaustion though she was well enough to make her traditional appearance outside Clarence House three days later to celebrate her 101st birthday. In December 2001, aged 101, Elizabeth fractured her pelvis in a fall. Even so, she insisted on standing for the national anthem during the memorial service for her husband on 6 February the following year. Just three days later, her second daughter Princess Margaret died. On 13 February 2002, Elizabeth fell and cut her arm in her sitting room at Sandringham House. An ambulance and doctor were called, and the wound was dressed. She was still determined to attend Margaret's funeral at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, two days later on the Friday of that week. Even though the Queen and the rest of the royal family were concerned about the journey the Queen Mother would face to get from Norfolk to Windsor, she was also rumoured to be hardly eating. Nevertheless, she flew to Windsor by helicopter, and so that no photographs of her in a wheelchair, which she hated being seen in, could be taken, she insisted that she be shielded from the press. She travelled to the service in a people carrier with blacked-out windows, which had been previously used by Margaret. On 5 March 2002, 
Elizabeth was present at the luncheon of the annual lawn party of the Eton Beagles, and watched the Cheltenham races on television. However, her health began to deteriorate precipitously during her last weeks, after retreating to Royal Lodge for the final time. On 30 March 2002, at 15.15, GMT, Elizabeth died in her sleep at the Royal Lodge, Windsor Great Park, with her surviving daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, at her bedside. She had been suffering from a chest cold for the previous four months. At 101 years and 238 days old she was the longest-lived member of the royal family in British history. Her last surviving sister-in-law, Princess Alice, Duchess of Gloucester, exceeded that, dying aged 102 on 29 October 2004. She was one of the longest-lived members of any royal family. Elizabeth grew camellias in every one of her gardens, and before her flag-draped coffin was taken from Windsor to lie in state at Westminster Hall, an arrangement of camellias from her own gardens was placed on top. An estimated 200,000 people over three days filed past as she lay in state in Westminster Hall at the Palace of Westminster. Members of the Household Cavalry and other branches of the armed forces stood guard at the four corners of the catafalque. At one point, her four grandsons Prince Charles, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward and Viscount Linley mounted the guard as a mark of respect. An honor similar to the vigil of the princes at the lying-in state of King George V on the day of her funeral, the 9th of April, the Governor-General of Canada issued a proclamation asking Canadians to honor Elizabeth's memory that day. In Australia, the Governor-General read the lesson at a memorial service held in St. Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney. In London, more than a million people filled the area outside Westminster Abbey and along the 23-mile, 37-kilometres, route from central London to Elizabeth's final resting place in the King George VI Memorial Chapel beside her husband and younger daughter in St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. At her request, after her funeral the wreath that had lain atop her coffin was placed on the tomb of the unknown warrior, in a gesture that echoed her wedding day tribute 79 years before. Known for her personal and public charm, Elizabeth was one of the most popular members of the royal family, and helped to stabilize the popularity of the monarchy as a whole. Elizabeth's critics included Kitty Kelly, who falsely alleged that she did not abide by the rationing regulations during the Second World War. Claims that Elizabeth used racist slurs to refer to black people were strongly denied by Major Colin Burgess, the husband of Elizabeth Burgess, a mixed-race secretary who accused members of Prince Charles's household of racial abuse. Elizabeth made no public comments on race, but according to Robert Rhodes James in private she abhorred racial discrimination and decried apartheid as dreadful. Woodrow Wyatt records in his diary that when he expressed the view that non-white countries have nothing in common with us, she told him, I am very keen on the Commonwealth. They're all like us. However, she did distrust Germans, she told Woodrow Wyatt, never trust them, never trust them. While she may have held such views, it has been argued that they were normal for British people of her generation and upbringing, who had experienced two vicious wars with Germany. In his official biography, William Shawcross portrays Elizabeth as a person whose indomitable optimism, zest for life, good manners, mischievous sense of humor, and interest in people and subjects of all kinds contributed to her exceptional popularity and to her longevity. Sir Hugh Casson said Elizabeth was like, a wave breaking on a rock, because although she is sweet and pretty and charming, she also has a basic streak of toughness and tenacity. Dot. When a wave breaks on a rock, it showers and sparkles with a brilliant play of foam and droplets in the sun, yet beneath is really hard, tough rock, fused, in her case, from strong principles, physical courage and a sense of duty. Sir Peter Ustinov described her during a student demonstration at the University of Dundee in 1968. 
As we arrived in a solemn procession the students pelted us with toilet rolls. They kept hold of one end, like streamers at a ball, and threw the other end. The Queen Mother stopped and picked these up as though somebody had misplaced them. Returning them to the students she said. Was this yours? Oh, could you take it? And it was her sang Freud and her absolute refusal to be shocked by this, which immediately silenced all the students. She knows instinctively what to do on those occasions. She doesn't rise to being heckled at all. She just pretends it must be an oversight on the part of the people doing it. The way she reacted not only showed her presence of mind, but was so charming and so disarming, even to the most rabid element, that she brought peace to troubled waters. Elizabeth was well known for her dry witticisms. On hearing that Edwina Mountbatten was buried at sea, she said, Dear Edwina, she always liked to make a splash. Accompanied by the gay writer Sir Noel Coward at a gala, she mounted a staircase lined with guards. Noticing Coward's eyes flicker momentarily across the soldiers, she murmured to him, I wouldn't if I were you, Noel. They count them before they put them out. After being advised by a conservative minister in the 1970s not to employ homosexuals, Elizabeth observed that without them, we'd have to go self-service. On the fate of a gift of a Nebuchadnezzar of champagne, 20 bottles worth, even if her family did not come for the holidays, she said, I'll polish it off myself. A mind saner of the Guardian suggests that with a gin and Dubonnet at noon, red wine with lunch, a port and martini at 6 p.m. and two glasses of champagne at dinner, a conservative estimate puts the number of alcohol units she drank at 70 a week. Her lifestyle amused journalists, particularly when it was revealed she had a multi-million pound overdraft with Coots Bank. Her habits were parodied by the satirical 1980s television program Spitting Image.